21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. I've been a medical doctor. I'm now retired for over 40 years. And in that time, I've been questioning the foundation of medical science, so-called, and biology, and even uh, what, what is it to know something? And what I've discovered is that there's a huge problem in what we call science, and in particular medicine, but also physics uh, and biology. And that is uh, most of the people, and now I'm talking about the general population, are what I would call scientifically illiterate. In other words, they don't know the basis of scientific or logical or rational thinking. But to my shock and a little bit to my surprise, I also discovered that most so-called scientists and biologists and medical doctors are also fundamentally scientifically illiterate. And to me, that's a problem because if we're supposedly basing our medicine and our biology and our, uh, the way we treat people on sound scientific principles and the medical doctors don't even know the basics, basis of scientific thinking, that is a recipe for disaster. You don't have to know what causes chicken pox or whether there's all you have to invest. Where did you get that from? And somehow you know, I, I went to medical school, right? I'm a trained, I was an ER doctor for a while. Like, I'm not unfamiliar with medical education or science education. I'm not unfamiliar. Every, you know, the, the, the practitioners in our new biology clinic, one is a board certified neurologist. One is a board certified psychiatrist. One is an oncologist. One is a family practitioner, one is a plastic surgeon, and one is an anesthesiologist pain specialist. These people are not unfamiliar with medical education and how the medical system works. Quite the contrary. They know it inside and out. They've been part, I mean, the guy's a neurologist for God's sake. And he knows that there is no possible way that there are synapses in nerves. And that's the fundamental basis of neuroanatomy and neuroscience in 2024. So you put, imagine three dots on a piece of paper and you say, are they in a straight line? And you can, you know, I say to people, if people say you should have debates and all, you don't need a debate. You don't need to consult the head of straight lineology at a university. You need a ruler. You met, you put the ruler on the three dots. They're not in a straight line. Nobody can convince you that they are because you have, you can understand from your own observation, your own perception and your own ability to think, which the more you do this, the better you get at it. And we have been taught and bullied and brainwashed and indoctrinated, especially the scientists and doctors, to not do this. We don't, we don't know where there's, they got the idea of virus from. No idea. I didn't have any idea five years ago. And that's weird, right? Because like... That's the basis of modern medicine. And everybody should ask their family doctor, how do you know there's a virus? I don't know. 
Like, that's weird. It's like going to a car mechanic and say, you know, my car doesn't stop at the red light. Do you think it's the brakes? And he says, what's a brake? Like, that's a problem. Let's talk about the scientifically illiterate part. What do I mean by that? And uh, I mean, that's a pretty, I would say, aggressive statement that I made, that my colleagues in medicine are <clears throat> fundamentally scientifically illiterate. Let me explain that by an example. Um, Let's say you're an 18 year old Asian fellow, right? And your parents are Caucasian. And you always wondered about that. And then one day you look in their parents' closet and you find adoption papers. And you say to your parents, you know, I've never seen a picture of mom pregnant. Is it true that I was adopted? And the mother says, yeah, you know, we, we adopted you from an orphanage in China and we were waiting to tell you because it's a big deal. But yes, you were adopted and here's the papers and everything. So that's clear. And then you go to your best friend and say, well, I just found out today I was adopted and I'm a little shook up. And your friend says, so who are your real parents? And you say, I don't know, because I just found out today. And he says, until you can tell me who your real parents are, I don't believe you were adopted. Now, as I can see, you're smiling because you know that's ridiculous, right? Now, let's use that in the framework of medicine. I've probably told thousands of people, including hundreds of medical doctors and scientists, there is no evidence for the existence of a virus. Zero. I've looked at the scientific papers going back 150 years. There is no, nobody has ever found a virus in any biological fluid. They admit it. And the way that they claim that they have found this virus is scientifically ridiculous. So I say to, the, I say to a fellow medical doctor, so there's no evidence uh, for the existence of a virus. That is a very specific claim, right? That viruses exist. Uh, and he, he or she says to me, so what causes chickenpox? In other words, who are your real parents? In other words, he or she doesn't know that the way science works is somebody makes a claim. There is a, an entity called chickenpox virus. That entity causes an illness we call chickenpox. And here's the proof that that's true. He doesn't know that that's the way he's supposed to do it. So rather than actually substantiate that claim, he uses an anti-scientific way of thinking, thinking that unless I can come up with a different theory for what this illness is, that somehow that it's it becomes valid that it's a virus. Now, that's ridiculous. And that that happens over and over. And then when you say to them, no, science, here's the difference between science and belief system. In science, the claim has to be able to be falsified. You have to be able to do an experiment or some observation that falsifies the claim. If you can't, then it's a belief, right? You say, I believe in leprechauns. And you say, how do you know that there are leprechauns? I, I can't think of an experiment. I just believe it. So I don't want to tell people what they should and shouldn't believe, right? That's up to them. And I don't, it's, there's nothing wrong with believing things, but if you can't do an experiment or an observation to prove whether there's leprechauns or not, 
then it's not a scientific claim. Now, when I apply that to the world of science and medicine, what I found is there is no evidence for the existence of viruses. There's no evidence that bacteria cause disease. Zero, not one scientific paper. There's no evidence that protozoa, sometimes called parasites, cause disease. There's no evidence that DNA is the mechanism of heredity. There's no evidence that DNA codes for, uh, for proteins in our body. There's no evidence for synapses in nerves or receptors on nerves. And by the way, something like 40% of the drugs that are used in conventional medicine are allegedly working on receptors like opiate receptors and serotonin receptors. But if you, go, if you look at an electron microscope picture of the cell membrane where these receptors are allegedly residing, there is no visual evidence of a receptor. In other words, they're invisible. Now think about it. How do you demonstrate that something that's invisible actually exists? I mean, it's interesting. And then when you look at the evidence they present, it is anything but controlled scientific reasoning. And, and I could go on and on with probably 20 or 30 more things that are claimed to be the foundation of biology and medicine, which if you actually just apply simple logic, like let me give you an example. They say that... Uh, <clears throat> RNA, mRNA, is translated, i.e. made into proteins on the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. That's a whole lot of words there. But this is very important because they just gave people mRNA shots all over the world, right? They're called COVID vaccines. And the point of that is to have these RNA make you make spike proteins or proteins in your cells. So this is a very important part of medicine. And they say that the location that this happens is the ribosome, right? That's, that's, that's the claim. Now, here's an interesting thing about ribosomes. Every single picture of a ribosome is a perfect circle. Every single picture. You can only see it on electron microscopy which means if it's a perfect circle on a two-dimensional photo, it was a sphere in real life, right? That's obvious. Now, if you realize that the way that this picture was obtained was the following. They took some tissue, like a heart, ground it up in a blender, uh, froze it to 150 degrees, uh, centrifuged it, mixed it with chemicals, uh, added uh, heavy metals to it, embedded it on a resin, and then took shot an electron beam that evaporated all the water. And then they get this perfect circle on the photograph. Now, just take one of those. If I, a perfect sphere would be like an orange. If I gave you an orange and put it in a blender, what are the chances that every piece of that orange would be a perfect circle? You know what the answer is? Zero. So that, that perfect circle cannot be a real phenomena. In other words, it's an artifact. In fact, a guy named Harold Hillman proved that all pictures of ribosomes are gas bubbles that form during that process, right? So in other words, there is no ribosome, or to put it more accurately, nobody has ever demonstrated the existence of a ribosome. Therefore, there is no location for this mRNA to be turned into protein. And then when you realize that they say each gene codes for one protein, gene means DNA makes RNA makes protein. One gene makes one protein. 
That's called the central dogma of genetics. Then they do this human genome project and find 200,000 proteins, 20,000 genes. And what that means is apparently geneticists don't understand arithmetic because there's 180,000 proteins that don't have a gene associated with it, which means the whole thing is make-believe. There's no ribosomes. Genes don't code for proteins like they say. So what are they giving you with an mRNA shot? Like, how is that supposed to make a protein? And then when you actually see that there's not one study published in the medical literature that says, if I give, you know, 10 grams of RNA, I get 10 grams of protein. And if I give one gram, I give one gram of protein, right? You'd think <clears throat> there would be hundreds of studies like that, but there's zero. In fact, nobody has even proven that giving mRNA makes anybody make proteins. Now, if you don't think that's important, it turns out that probably 500 million people were given a injection in order to make them make a protein to supposedly help them out on a theory which is disproven. And I happen to think that's a problem. <laughs> I can't prove that, of course, but that's the way I see the world. Now, let me, if you want, let me switch tracks a little bit to, to help people understand why this is so important what I'm saying. Is that all right? So I'm going to give you a thought experiment, which is partly based on reality. So I happen to really like cats. I didn't used to, but I have four. And one of them is named Pumpkin. And after he eats, he goes outside because he can come and go as he wants. And he sits on the deck before he decides where to go. And he looks around. He looks this way, he looks up, he looks around, and he moves his ears like cats do, apparently listening for what's out there. And then he smells the air, and he whooshes his tail in various ways. And he does that for maybe 5 to 20 minutes. Now, I'm not sure, but I think what he's doing is assessing the area, right? Is there coyotes? Because there's coyotes and bobcats and danger out there. Is there things that I don't want to be? Is there mice that I can eat and birds and squirrels and all that? In other words, he's using his senses. And tails, I think, actually are sense organs for electromagnetism. I, I don't want to get into that. But so he's he's using his senses to assess what to do next, where the dangers are and where his food is, right? Does that make sense? Now, and that's how, then when he decides, he goes off and does whatever he's gonna do. Now, imagine you said to Pumpkin, Pumpkin, there's a danger out there, which is a mortal danger. In other words, it could kill you or really harm you. But you won't, you don't have any sensory impression of whether that danger is present or not. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't hear it, you can't sense it. And you could somehow convince him that this was true. What would he do then? Think about it. He would be scared out of his mind. And my guess is he would run back in the house and hide under the bed. And he would be trying to figure out how to know whether this mortal danger was present or not. But no matter what he did, he couldn't, he wouldn't know, he couldn't see it, couldn't smell it, couldn't sense it. And he would be in a panic because he doesn't know whether something's going to get him. And my guess is he wouldn't be able to sleep. He wouldn't be able to relax. He would eventually, he wouldn't be able to catch his food properly. 
and he wouldn't go outside because he didn't know if something was going to get him, right? It would change his whole life and he would start getting weak and worried and fearful and his whole life would be different. It's easy to see that if we become convinced that there are mortal uh, grave dangers to us, that we have no sensory impression at all, that that changes everything. And here's the thing, every one of us, everyone listening is living under many such delusions uh, some of and they don't even know it and all of them are essentially making them fearful which is a huge health problem it's causing them to give up their sovereignty in other words they say oh there's this virus now you don't have any sense impression of a virus you don't taste it you don't smell it you don't see it you don't even know how anybody came up with that idea Therefore, since they tell you it's a mortal danger, you are therefore forced to rely on so-called experts to do things to you and tell you what to do to mitigate the danger. Even to the point of doing things, which almost always happens, of doing things which are actually harmful to you, like putting plastic sheets over your nose and mouth so you can't breathe or closing your business or not seeing your friends or family or some people never going out of their house and then to top it off they inject you with poisons which are now known to uh, adversely affect your health for what turns out to be a make-believe fictitious danger the same with you have a genetic disease. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You don't know how they came up with that. There's nothing you can do about it. And you you have no ability to, to have any conscious sensation about that. You are toast. You are under the mercy of people who you have to trust, who they themselves mostly don't know where that theory came from either and don't know that it's actually been disproven. That is a real problem. Now, it's not just medicine and biology. I happen to have looked into things like, you know, the existence of an atom, which is far from disproven. Dispro In fact, if you go back and look at how they proved atoms exist, it's basically a joke. And how they proved electrons exist, it's it's a anti-scientific exercise in nonsense. To the point where one of the founders of the electron theory, a guy named Erwin Schrodinger, said, ah, oh, you know, if you looked in a, an atom, you'd never see an electron. Now, what's the point of that? If there's no atom and there's no nucleus, then there cannot be nuclear weapons. You can't split something that doesn't exist. Now, we've spent for the last 75 years, everybody in the world has spent money, right? By, by you know, the government has spent trillions of dollars on nuclear weapons. We're terrified of them. We're supposedly, if they're, they're about to have a nuclear war any day now for the last 50 years, and it turns out the whole thing is make-believe. And so if you, if you construct a make-believe world, you will end up with terrified people who willingly give up their sovereignty and their ability to be free to any tyrant that comes along. The other thing that happens, which is 
something that is even in some ways more insidious or at least as insidious is our greatest gift is to use our abilities and our mind to progressively learn more about the world. That's what human beings are doing, right? We, and we do that by collecting information from our senses. We see things, we smell things, we do experiments and extend our ability to see things etc and then we put those into our mind and come out with and hopefully an understanding of the world what's happening now is because people have learned not to trust themselves right because the biggest dangers like viruses and nuclear weapons and ribosomes and genetics are all unseen unsensed unobservable things they have <clears throat> given up the quest to make their sensory observations more exact, more precise, and more effective. So now people don't know whether their food is any good or not, because they used to be able to say, you know, if you spend your whole life assessing the quality of the food, if you get if you give somebody processed food, they don't want to eat it. Doesn't taste like food. It's no good for me. I don't like this. This water tastes sour. It's got chemicals in it. I'm not going to eat it. But now people have given, you know, we've essentially been told the important things in your life, you have no sensory input in it at all. You don't know whether this thing exists or not. So you never practice. You're like a piano player who never practices the piano and you cannot play even a simple tune. You don't know what to eat. You don't know what to drink. You don't know how to move or whether to move. And again, this is a road towards essentially slavery and poor health, which is <laughs> welcome to our world. So now we come to the point of uh, hopefully it, as you're listening to this, you are saying to yourself something like, okay, so where do I go from here? Uh, how, how do I take this? So that's, it's an interesting question and something that I've you know, been thinking about working on and working with patients on for for basically my whole career of 40 years. Because I've also realized in this that this process that I'm describing has a very strong relationship to health and illness. And I would put it like Basically, we hex ourselves. We cast a spell on ourselves. That's another way. So, for instance, we say, you know, what's what's wrong? You know, I, I'll ask a patient, so how are you feeling? And they say, I have Lyme disease. And I say, so tell me how you feel. And then they say, well, people with Lyme disease have multiple joint pains. And then I say again, so how do you feel? Like, how does your, how does your knee feel? And then interestingly, sometimes they get angry at me and say, Dr. Cowan, I thought you were an expert on Lyme disease. Don't you know how people with Lyme disease uh, joints feel? And so at that point, I know what the problem is. The problem is not Lyme disease, because interestingly, Lyme disease itself is a made-up diagnosis. How do I know that? 
Because if you go to the medical literature and say, what is the definition of Lyme disease? There is none. Uh, how, what is the cause of Lyme disease? It's a spirochete. Now, that's a kind of bacteria. Now, I happen to look up the original study that uh, allegedly proves that this illness called Lyme disease, which was not defined in the paper, is caused by a spirochete. And what I found was they had 59 people with a variety of symptoms, and three of them had evidence of this spirochete in their blood or other tissues. And I said to the, I would say to them, if you had 59 houses on your block that were demolished, and in three of them you found skunks walking around the house, would you conclude that the skunks blew up the houses? And of course, nobody would do that. And yet somehow that became the study which proved that Lyme disease was caused by a spirochete, <clears throat> which then everybody is essentially forced to believe it after that. So then they essentially treat you with this undefined illness by killing the spirochete. So a much better way of doing that and uh, doing life and doing medicine, again, we go back to the pumpkin story, say, what is it that you feel? Well, uh, when I wake up in the morning, my foot hurts. Where does your foot hurt? Right on the top, right there. You see, and does it look funny? Yes, it's swollen and it's red. And if I stick it with my finger, it hurts even more. And when did that start? Well, it started eight weeks ago. Did anything happen, you know, nine, 10, 11 weeks ago? Yes, my wife started every morning hitting me with a hammer on the top of my foot. And what? how soon after that did it hurt? About a week or so. And has she continued to do that? Yes, yeah, she does it every day. She thinks it's good for my soul. So at that point, I don't have any theory as to uh, the name of this illness, except you could call it wife hits you on the top of the foot itis. But I have a suggestion for the person, which is for the next two weeks, tell your wife not to hit you with the hammer on the top of the foot and then tell me whether things get better. And lo and behold, and this is almost a true story, which got me thinking about this 30 years ago. It's not exactly, but it's close enough. Uh, the whole thing went away <laughs> because that was the problem. And if I had uh, done a blood test and found out she had rheumatoid arthritis based on an antibody, which turns out is nonspecific and doesn't mean anything, it would have thrown me off. And it's another example of how if you go down the path of make believing in things which you have no experience of, you will end up lost. Now, the, the second corollary to this, and this is often difficult for people because it brings up a lot of emotions and a lot of discomfort. It, but it's something that that works better with the more you practice it. So let me finish the first one. So as far as how you relate to yourself, relate everything to your personal felt experience. This is how I feel. This is when I feel it. This is where I feel it. Uh, and you get better and better at describing what it's like to be you. And it's actually a skill that you develop over time. And by the way, that's how in our new biology clinic, that's how we work with people. We never bring in the diagnosis, you have Lyme disease or whatever. It's our job is to hear a person's individual story tease out the details, find out everything we can about when it happens, where it happens, what the circumstances are, 
and then attempt to interface with that story, with that person who has the story to make their life better. It is a dramatically much more effective way of doing medicine, dramatically. It was the biggest revelation in my career. Once I convinced myself that the diseases and the causes of them are make-believe, I no longer was interested in finding them, unlike doctors. That's all they do. They find the disease and they look up the, the treatment in the book or they memorize it. And you don't even exist in that equation. So we're putting the individual back in the picture because that's all there is. Now, the second principle, which again is a skill, is like I started with the example of the, of the adopted boy, you focus your attention only on finding out what isn't true rather than finding out what is true. Because finding out what is true is a difficult and often frustrating quest, but it's often straightforward to find out that this claim, this story that you're being told is not true. Now, there will be times when you will be left in an uncomfortable place that you don't know where you are. All you know is that you don't have Lyme disease. It's not caused by a spirochete. You know, you don't have to be afraid of nuclear weapons or whatever it is because they don't exist. And you don't know what the what these start treaties are about. <clears throat> like, what are they negotiating? And are these people lying? Are they just stupid or whatever? You don't have to know that. All you have to know is I've investigated the matter. The viruses don't exist. The bacteria don't cause all these things. They don't exist. Now, here's what happens if, in, you know, you'll have emotions and I'm scared and where do, where do I stand and people think I'm crazy and all this stuff. But as you do it more and more, you get better and better. Now, here's what I've noticed happens. It certainly happens to me. When I am able to do that, and then I say, I ask myself the question, so I wonder what is true here? In other words, you've erased the false, and now you're in this sort of open place. And to me, I can't prove what I'm about to say, but I have seen this in myself and with so many people. Somehow the world helps you out. Something comes, like I'll say, I don't understand how they uh, sequence base pairs or what the what the third, you know, uh, like a position on the base pair means. And, and all I know is what they're telling me isn't true. Two days later, I get an email from a biochemist who says, oh, you know, I've been working on base pairs and I'll tell you what that means. And I, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't contact, I don't know how that happens. It's happened over and over and over again. When I can be okay with the 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 emotional and intellectual stance of i know this isn't true i don't know what is true yet i'm open to hear i open to hear ideas you will start getting more and more ideas and you will start learning more and more about the world than you ever thought possible and there will become a lightness and a feeling of I got this in your life, which will transform the way your life works. As far as entrepreneurs, the only thing I and I I can say the only thing I have to say about that is 
There are many what you could call make believe or superstitions. Many. I haven't even touched on. Them. But <clears throat> one of the biggest, if not the biggest, one of them is the is the phenomena or the idea of government. See, there is no such thing as a government. Uh, it's it's a abstract concept which doesn't exist in quote reality. In other words, if you say I want to talk to the government, you can't talk to the government. You talk to a person who claims that they represent the government. Not only that, but <clears throat> this idea of the government gets people to do things that they would never do otherwise. Like I often ask people, how many people if I'm talking like in a to a live crowd how many people have gone over to their neighbor's house and said, look, I just saw that you made an addition on your house. You need to give me a thousand dollars a month for the next 10 years, or I'm going to put you in a cage. Like nobody would do that, right? Nobody would do that. Uh, and yet that's what the government does. And, and they say, how did they, how do they claim that it's legal? because a bunch of you got together and decided that it was okay to do that. So I asked people, what would you take 20 of your friends and go to your neighbor's house and say, look, if you don't give me 10,000 a year to send our children to school, then we're going to burn your house down or put you in a cage. Like nobody would do that. But yet they somehow think it's right or just if the quote government does it. Now, how does that relate to entrepreneurs? There's, there's two types. The one is people who understand that, that there is no government. They make, they come up with ideas. Like if I make, you know, screws or bicycles or something or a new clinic that people will like that. They try to implement the idea as best they can. They make screws that work quicker and are easier to put in. And then they see if people will buy it. And if they do, and they make money and they make a profit and they hire more people and they make more screws, and then they do even better. And then they do even better and they do even better. Next thing you know, they have a big business that's making a lot of money and helping people because they have better screws or bicycles or a clinic. That's real entrepreneurship. But there is another kind of entrepreneurship, interestingly practiced by people like Elon Musk, where they come up with an idea or maybe steal an idea. It doesn't work. People don't want it. And they go to the government to fund their project. An example of that was the vaccines. So in 1980s, there were so many people suing the vaccines for harming manufacturers, for harming them, that they were going out of business. Fair enough. They had a shitty prod product that was doing no good and was harming people. And so people were getting pissed off and they were going after the owners and the board and the company, et cetera. Fair enough. So what did the company do? Because they're not real entrepreneurs. They go to the government and say, you make a law that nobody can sue us and then we'll be able to keep going. And that's what they did. So that is not entrepreneurship. That's a scam. Now, you know, most of the big tech and information and Google and all, they are scams. They are government-sponsored, government-funded entities that couldn't exist without the government. And as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> they should be allowed to fold because they couldn't exist in a actually an entrepreneurial environment because nobody wants their screws. So they literally have to use violence to force people to buy their screws. 
That's how you end up with a sick society. You know, we in our in our business and our clinic, New Biology Clinic, and drtomcowan.com and Dr. Cowan's Garden, we are working with these principles and trying to, you know, help people by getting products that by supplying products that work and a medical uh, system that's based on reality and not make believe. So if you're intrigued and found what I had to say interesting, please look us up and join us. And I'd love to hear your feedback and comments. And hopefully we can build a better world together. First Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskorik. Imagine a space where triumphs, trials, and tales of entrepreneurship come alive. Welcome to the 21st Century Entrepreneurship Podcast, a gold awarded journey hosted by Martin Piskorik, connecting with listeners in 95 countries and ranking in the top 0.5% of all podcasts. Join our exclusive community, elevate your perspective, and embark on the path to success.